Okay, it's, uh, I think it's time to start. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to be late, so we'll have time to, to discuss uh, during the panel. So uh, I would like to, to, thank, uh, to thank everyone who, who is joining uh, this, uh, this session. I think we're gonna have a very interesting panel. Um, let me maybe share my screen. I have a, just a few slides to... Uh, Okay, I guess you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes, okay, so we, we have the, the honor and the, the great uh, joy to have with us uh, uh, three, actually it's, the, the panel is organized by uh, myself and Martin, and we have the, the honor to, uh, to have with us uh, 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 Dina demsher fussman uh, I guess that uh, most of you were also uh, joined the invited talk session. So uh, Dina uh, heads the Natural Language Processing Group at the Lister Hill Center for Biomedical Communications at the USNLM. Uh, her lab research is multimodal question answering and text processing for clinical decision support. Uh, she already mentioned very interesting things in, the, uh, in her invited talk that we will have the chance to, uh, to elaborate. <clears throat> Also, we have uh, with us uh, Keith, uh, Keith Hall, uh, who is a research scientist at Google. He leads a team for engineers and researchers working on developing tools and models for search and discovery for scientific publications. Uh, and his team actually has uh, built the Google COVID Research Explorer and uh, Google Biomed Explorer. Um, also have with us uh, Hong Zhu, uh, and uh, as uh, the head of uh, intelligence services group at Atipon, Hong leads the R&D and implementation for cloud-based solution that leverages advanced AI, big data, and related technologies, as well as the design of Atipon's next generation information discovery system. And he's closely focused on supporting publishers and researcher uh, success in the open access and open uh, science movements. Uh, also, as I said, we have also uh, with us uh, Martin Kralinger, who is also the uh, co-organizer of the BioAsk, and uh, he's leading the Messiness task. Uh, Martin is the head of the text mining uh, unit at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Uh, he's responsible uh, of the health-related activities of the Spanish plan of the, advancement of the advancement of language technology. He works on the development of biomedical and clinical text mining application, including clinical NER and semantic indexing components. And he's one of the main organizers of the BioCreative channels, as well as other biomedical NLP search tasks like BioAsk. So welcome all. Um, uh, as I said, it's an honor to have you here. And I think we have very interesting uh, things to discuss. Uh, Keith is with us. I, I don't know, I cannot see. Ah, yes, he's here. Yes, sorry. Yes, I couldn't see the. Yeah, yes, great. So uh, we decided to focus uh, this panel to uh, the benefit, and uh, as if we can put a title on the panel, uh, on the panel uh, topic, it would be the explicit and implicit benefits from challenges like BioAsk. Um, and uh, probably we can start in, you know, in uh, after Dina's talk that she talks about, uh, you know, the challenges during the COVID uh, era, if we can say era. Uh, I think it, it's, it's a good uh, point to start about how challenges can add in emergencies uh, like uh, COVID-19. Uh, so you, we have seen several uh, tasks and challenges that have arise. Uh, Dina describes the track uh, related ones. BioAsk also has a, the BioAsk synergy task, and there are more uh, where all of them try to tackle uh, issues related to COVID. Uh, and uh, I would like to hear the, the opinion of the panelists or what's the direction and how they see this goes on uh, in the future. So probably, Dina, you can start as you had also the invite talk and probably you can say a few words of that if you want. Yes, so, um, you know, I, I believe um, the challenges help us explore the approaches that no one, well, I don't know, you know, <laughs> uh, probably big companies could explore the uh, challenges that we have on their own, but one single research group could never explore all the approaches in that short amount of time 
that the groups do uh, when they um, participate in challenges. And, you know, uh, you all probably know the NIST um, point that they always try to make, that this is not a competition. And when I participated, particularly when I started participating, um, I never got that point. For me, it was a competition and I wanted to win it. But as I grow older, I think I do believe more into uh, in the, um, yes, competition, but it's good to have that competition. And the main point is not winning, but exploring as a community, all these approaches and sharing. Okay, thank, thank, you, very, thank you very much, Dina. Uh, uh, Hong, do you want to, to add something on that? Or? Sure, sure. I totally agree, uh, agree with Dina. Dina. And uh, you know, the, all, I think the output of this competition is, uh, is a win-win situation. So everyone will win no matter you know the first or the second or something and the, the because i'm working in the academic publishing industry so one of the challenges in the, regarding the covid-19 is you know there's two two challenges for us one is you know the how can we speed up you know the uh, from the 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 manuscript writing up to the publishing reduce the time so that you know the other publish uh, other the researchers can see the latest research you know work the second is, you know, how we can help, you know, the researchers to quickly to, and then discover and find the information they are looking for. So I think this is a two, and, and the third one. Third one is, you know, the because as a corporate, the we want to always want to collaborate with, you know, the the best, the most relevant researchers to tackle, you know, the some uh, the tasks. For example, COVID nineteen. And the, some drug companies want to do it. So this challenge, BioAsk the challenge, can provide uh, this environment and opportunity so that the, we all, you know, the researchers, uh, incorporate, you know, the internal R&D team and the, you know, the institutions uh, can work together, can know each other, can share the, you know, their, the, can brainstorming, can share the, the best idea. So I think this is the three things, you know, that we definitely benefit from this. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, Hong. Uh, Keith, do you want to collaborate on more on that? Or? Uh, yeah, sure, just briefly. Uh, I mean, in general, challenges are really good for rallying the research community. And, and that, you know, is true inside a big company as well as, you know, at uh, academic institutions. Uh, you know, if we didn't actually focus them towards important tasks, then we'd all just work on Wikipedia, which, you know, tends to be where all the other challenges go. So it is very important, you know, that there, you know, are organizations that will, you know, take on creating challenges that uh, attract the attention of all research communities, in, including those inside large corporations. And I mean, for us, uh, you know, we collaborated with other teams inside Google Research uh, to work on Trek COVID. Uh, that might not have happened without Trek COVID being around. And uh, that's, you know, it's really great. And I do like the idea that it's competition, but it's good for all because in the end, you know, we all learn what techniques work the best. And uh, that should help us, you know, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Martin, you want to add something on, on this? So, so um, the only thing maybe to add there is it's really a way to actually generate resources in a very, let's say, transparent way, meaning that you generate or share data, supposedly also partially you share the methodology behind these solutions, in some cases code, and in some cases even like predictions or aut automatic, like let's say, results, in addition to, I would say, um, sharing also like uh, or being a, a platform to, to interact and share experiences, like to learn learn from others, and, and that's something which is really key. If you have like emergency sit situations, you need to learn how different people are solving a similar problem. And I think you know this virtual environments and, and engaging different kind of communities is you know is key. And challenges are a, a way to promote these kind of things. No. It's my opinion, especially rapidly changing topics, rapidly changing content, 
and with real end user demands, I mean, this is an efficient way to solve the problem, I would say. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I, I agree with all of you. Uh, and uh, I think th this can move us also to the second topic we want to discuss that I think that now the, the goal is to try to move challenges from, you know, the very uh, participant, if I can say, oriented task where we're trying to uh, solve problems that are fitted on, you know, specific methods and try to, um, to put uh, you know, a context that is easy for the participants to, to, to work on to, to move to more realistic tasks, uh, like it is now uh, all the COVID related tasks and even more, and try to work also on real data and not um, data that ha has been built only for the scope of the challenge and that really um, well manipulated in the way that is, is, is easy for the systems, but are really far from the real, uh, real life. Uh, challenges, um, and so I think this this is going to be uh, also the future on, on having challenges on realistic data. Uh, and the way I see it, and I want your opinion on that, is in order to achieve this, uh, is we have to uh, to have the the end users of of the task that we're trying to uh, to work on, if it's a question answering for uh, for biomedical experts, to have the biomedical experts, for example, get involved. Uh, in the design of the challenges and uh, not only to have them as evaluators or, uh, uh, you know, annotators, because what we're trying to, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with the challenges is to, to meet their needs. Uh, so my opinion is that we need to involve them in the design of the new tasks and challenges or try to, to, to go uh, more to more realistic tasks and more realistic data. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Keith, do you want to, to, to add something on that? Uh, well, um, I mean, more realistic tasks, I, the, you know, one task that we've come across with some people we work with, uh, you know, especially in large pharma, um, you know, is systematic review. And uh, that's something where, you know, systematic review is done differently in different fields, uh, and at least in biomedicine, you know, there, there is a traditional evidence-based medicine technique, uh, and it doesn't necessarily interact perfectly with the way uh, modern retrieval and uh, you know, QA type systems work. And maybe a challenge that, it, you know, I think uh, synergy is one challenge which starts touching on that, where you're actually asking questions where you, you know, you don't know the answer if it's there, you don't know that there's a specific paper. Um, but even more so also having a challenge where you really are trying to cover uh, multiple different dimensions along a particular question and, you know, or clinical question in, in this context uh, where many systematic reviews are focused around some core uh, clinical question. I think, you know, those types of, um, I mean, it's not easy to, uh, if it was easy, we'd probably already have a challenge related to this, right? But those types of real world tasks keep popping up for us that there are many, uh, you know, customers in our case that actually, you know, want to do literature, literature search uh, more in a more streamlined fashion, uh, but still have the same sort of analysis and results that uh, that you get when you use the traditional like PICOS approach to doing uh, evidence based medicine. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, Martin? Uh, do, you, do you think the, this is something that uh, is feasible or how feasible it is and how you see it uh, coming? So um, I think maybe we should actually have the end user in the loop of the design. So I think this is key to understand their needs. And, and even for like in semantic indexing, there's so many ways on um, framing a realistic task in terms of reducing indexing time, uh, increasing efficiency, increasing consistency. Uh, decreasing the cost, uh, un indexing unlabeled data collection. So there, there might be quite a lot of different realistic scenarios and each of them would have slightly different way on uh, evaluation, even the metrics or even the data on the data side on selecting the appropriate data. Um, so I think it's difficult to solve and there's some interface or even the user interaction in there as well. So I think it's very complex, but we should actually explore a little more the different, let's say, usage scenarios of these various systems and have the end user also in the loop of the design. Sometimes maybe just a quality metric is not enough for them. 
uh, and we don't really. It, I think we we we're very comfortable in in with the traditional evolution scenarios and metrics, but we don't go beyond that in many cases. So I I think we should think about realistic tasks, but maybe also know where we should stop there as well where you know it's not 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 a task of the our community it's a task of, of another community and you know, like interface design and in user interaction these kind of things okay thank, thank you martin uh, hong you want to yeah uh, I, I think the one of the distinguished the distinct uh, feature of the bio ask is that the task is, uh, is actually it's come from real life with real data for example, the mesh tagging task from the NL is a uh, annotated the new Madeline citation. So actually, the performance is uh, you know is increased from the fifty percent to the zero point seventy percent, which is twenty seven percent you know improvement. I think that all this has already highlighted the success of the bio ask. Um, but regarding the the new you know the realistic uh, tasks. I agree with Martin. We can, you know, the, we definitely need, you know, we can add the more task with the more data to meet the the real, you know, the requirement in the real, you know, the application. For example, is end to end the question answers? Can we provide the, you know, the a text without, you know, the annotated snippets or something to get the answers? Or we can, you know, the can we do the semantics the index not only based on the abstract? But also based on the full text, or based on the selected, you know, the sections, because of many sections is, a, is very important in the research work. And also, you know, the can we can we add also, you know, regarding the information retrieval. Currently, we focus on the return, the you know, the um, bit only based on the content similarity and the query. But can we add? And can we add also the others information, for example, the users information, the interests or the history or something to, pro, to, in, to identify or pro, evaluate the more personalized information retrieval. So this is, I think that's something we can think because the personalization is, you know, the one of the, and is a trend, is one of the, you know, the, the direction and think the, Many industries is a uh, is a follow. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Hong. Uh, Dina. Uh, yeah, just sort of reinforce that yes. um, it's hard to determine where the the um, the challenge becomes more about solving some someone's specific problem as opposed to developing computational approaches and advancing our research fields. So I, I think the task absolutely should be um, the, the latter, not the former, because uh, someone's specific problem is probably better solved by um, if they targeted some company and, and got that. And the other part is we are always hunting for the evaluation metrics that actually reflect the end result. And this is really hard. So um, there is probably more research to come in, in the evaluation metrics and how they, they should bias the systems towards the task. Exactly, Dina, I, I totally agree. And I think also one point that has to do with evaluation metrics, the, most of them are now focused on which system is better and uh, which computational method is better. And probably we need some metrics or I don't know if it's metrics or way to evaluate how good is the task for, for the users uh, that it, it tackles. Uh, a, a simple one can be the, the one that we are using, for example, in biosynergies questionnaires to the experts uh, to tell us their opinion on the task and if it's helpful and what they see that could be get better, but of course, better ways could also, you know, the, the, there could be better, I don't know, some, uh, uh, I could think of some workshop or, you know, some events uh, with, with the end users to, to, to go deeply more in their needs and how, how this could go to, to a more realistic task, if we can say, and, uh, and go more towards their needs. 
Okay, great. Thank you all. And I would like to mention, I didn't mention in the beginning, if someone from uh, from the audience wants to, to 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 add something or want to ask something, please 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 feel free to to participate. Uh, we want also your opinion on that. Um, okay, so. Uh, Moving to the third point, uh, which also very closely relates to what we discussed, is having realistic tasks uh, for, the, for the end users that we're working on can help us move also the challenges from, from, from tasks to potential applications. So we're doing all this effort all these years to have, uh, you know, have challenges running for years and uh, tasks running. Um, uh, running have systems that get better and better, have very good accuracies, etc. Uh, but I think the ultimate goal of this challenge is try to create applications for the users to be to, 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 to be used. Uh, and uh, one example I can think of is, uh, for example, the, the semantic indexing of BioAsk. Uh, as we have NLM uh, working closely with us and helping us, we have seen that actually methods that have been developed during the challenge uh, have been used and the, the participants have collaborated with NLM at the end and now the, uh, the, the MTI indexer uh, has, been, has become better based on the help, if we can say, of the system that have participated in the BioAsk. Uh, so this is one application I can see that is, is there and uh, how the challenge can ha have helped in real life in a real application. But of course, there are many more to, to come. Uh, for example, for the question answering, I have not seen, at least from the BioAsk side, something to have come in, you know, in real practice, for example, in, a, in a real application. Uh, so I would like to, to hear your opinion on that. So Hong, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think the first thing I want to um, make a point I want to make is uh, BioAsk is actually is designed for the real problem with real data. So I think it's not hard to move from the challenge tasks to the potential applications. I actually you know the, because you know the, in my experience, I have seen the many, you know, the uh, application based on the, you know, the semantic, uh, you know, the indexing, the classification, classifications, label classifications. For example, the, and also, you know, the, it's you, uh, you know, output of this task, we will speed up the content discoverability and the readability. For example, all these topics which are identified in the, during the semantic indexing can be displayed in the article. So that helps the reader and the user to quickly understand what this information, what art, this article is talking about. And also we can add this, uh, this all these topics and uh, the classified topics in the recommendation we will recommend or suggest some of the relevant, you know, articles, and we can, you know, make uh, explainable. So they say, why we explain this? Uh, why we suggest this article? Because this article has the similar topics with this, the one you are reading. And also, you know, the, we can use, an, another point I try to make is, you know, the, the, the all the technology and the multi-label multi classification, and the you know the developed in the biomedical domain could be used in the other domain as well, in the social sense, in the engineering, as long as they have you know the taxonomy available, etc. And another another you know the application another two application I have seen you know the so far, which could be the based on the the multi level. And classification is one is called a research analytics. So basically identify the trending topics, the most influential journal, paper, researchers in specific area. This is all based on the tag topics. And also the in the marketing, you know, in the marketing e-commerce marketing industry, we, we need to you know the identify the user profiling, do the user profiling. How can we do this? Sometimes it can be done by based on the user behavior interaction with a certain content. And this certain content, this content can be represented by a list of the topics which get from the semantic indexing. So this is a many, the different, many different uh, application we could be used based on the, the, the technology solutions developed in this challenge. 
And the once the last point I want to make is the the output of the research the competition is not only you know is not only for the publication to publish in the paper, but actually the more important for me is to solve the real problem in the world. Thanks. Exactly. Thank you, Hong. Uh, uh, Dina. Yeah. So um, just continuing what Hong said, um, the it, it's sort of funny, right? So I'm in a place where um, previously it was our task to take it from research into applications, and we have done that, for example, with our image retrieval open eye search engine, where uh, we presented our work to our board of scientific counselors. And they said, and the questions we had for the board was, should we continue exploring new approaches to combining image features and text, or should we uh, create a system for the public to retrieve all these images from PubMed central articles? And they said both. And you know, it took us a year to actually put the system into production because the ideas were there, but make it real time, make it scalable, make it, you know, all of these, it is also research, but it is engineering, software and hardware engineering research. So, uh, and this is, so with the new board of scientific counselors now, they are saying, no, actually your job is done when you publish the paper. And that engineering part, people will use your ideas. And I think this is true because, you know, it's very hard to know which parts of our research contributed to some commercial tool that is using, say, mesh indexing or that is using uh, some of the named entity recognition approaches that we have developed. So we have not developed the products uh, or you know, the commercial strength products uh, for many of the research uh, ideas that we have done, but hopefully there, and, and it's very hard um, to like say, oh, this comes from there for so many reasons, right? Maybe someone just sort of like read the article and doesn't even remember that they read the article. So there is a lot of, I think that if um, you do good research, it's probably okay to stop uh, with a good research result and not necessarily take it into the application. And I wish there was a way to, for the applications to acknowledge where some of their sources are coming from but again, uh, we had these discussions at the National Library of Medicine with uh, our policymakers, and they were saying, well, this is a double-edged sword because then people say, if uh, someone says, I used the product uh, of NLM to develop this tool, someone might say, this is endorsed by NLM, which we don't do, or worse yet, if it's really bad, they will then say, oh, look what NLM has done. So it, it's it's a bit tricky. Yeah, I see your point, and, and the, this is the more practical thing on how you go from from the, the talent or the research you're doing to the application, and you know it's it's a real issue. I, I totally understand. Uh, where yes, I, I think I think it's an open question. Uh, I think that the one thing has to do with a more abstract thing of how how we design the talent is in order to be able to go to, uh, at the end, to, to an application. And the other one is a more practical on how we, we having the idea and having things there, how, how we really uh, go into application where it's more, as you said, engineering and uh, uh, engineering thing, uh, but also policy thing, <laughs> as you uh, really mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Martin? <clears throat> so um, my, my comment is like, uh, I think to, generate this application, you need to get access to the system somehow. Uh, there have been this, been this effort to like have a code submission kind of um, evolution scenarios, for, which for our cases, I think they're you know, not really suitable. They're too complex solution and you would ban somehow commercial participants. We tried to do something like in BioCreative, have like web services, as, uh, online submission through web services. These are not really well maintained, so they're gone after a while. 
we did even some benchmarking on basically what, what Dina said. I mean, it's not just quality, it's also robustness, scalability, how efficient these, these tools are when applied like in on the real settings. And we did some evaluation on that side, but still the these systems are gone after some time. So I'm really frustrated with the not getting access to code. The code isn't, we cannot run the code. The web services are gone after some time. Uh, and I, I think there should be some way to actually pr promote that people are actually sharing part of their system in a way that people can make use of them. So if you don't do that, then these systems will never turn into real application if it's not a commercial solution, a commercial participant directly exploiting their code. Um, yeah, so I'm a little frustrated, I have to say, from the academic participants that there's not enough effort in, you know, turning their participants, the participating system into some useful code, which is also interoperable, scalable, robust enough to be used for potential applications. Yeah, this is a good point. And this is something what that we have also seen and, and discussed. And uh, we have also discussed if, if there are ways to motivate to motivate the participants on having, you know, their their code uh, uh, good maintained and explainable and reproducible, etc. And I don't know if a task on that would be useful, you know, to have people working on on making their system like this. Uh, but um, <laughs> um, as, as a comment, I think they're actually different communities, so like the software engineers. So we yes. saw when we had the web service task, they really are not the NLP people or deep learning, machine learning, they're really more technical software engineering experts. And, you know, they're, they're different kind of communities. I'm afraid that it's true. there might be just different people. Yes, but probably yeah. to try to bring these people together and uh, help each other, that would be, you know, a, a way. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. So I, I just add one more point built on the, what Martin said. And uh, for the researcher and researcher and the commercial applications, uh, you know, the company have the different the objective goals when develop solutions. Researchers, you know, the way we participate the challenge, we focus on to to develop the most, you know, the the, the best solutions which you know the achieve the best the highest accuracy, etc. But in the re real applications. We not necessarily focus on the, the the highest you know the score the accuracy, but we focus on the you know most reliable scalable, and the solutions. Sometimes even we you know the we sacrifice in the accuracy a little bit, is still okay. So I think the the most important thing is how can we balance this two. You know when we talk about you know move from the challenge task to potential application. We need to align with our different objectives and have the balance between these different objectives. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the contributions. Um, going to more technical, if I can say, uh, point, uh, something that have come up and I think everybody's uh, uh, is having a question about that is now, now that we have moved to the deep learning era where all methods more, most of the method, methods are you know deep learning based and uh, uh, where uh, we, we we're wondering where the traditional approaches fits in and tools and uh, uh, in what way they are useful or not uh, Martin, do you want to, to, to elaborate on that as you are also the, the person who, who wanted to discuss also this issue? Um, well, my message would be more, I'm missing a little more what would be a baseline. So when, when you have all these extra, more sophisticated methods, I'm, I'm missing a little more with very simple tools, you know, what is actually the gain and to focus more on where to apply the deep learning or more sophisticated cases. So in, in our case, like the indexing trust, there's, there's, there's an areas with few data and uh, there's an areas with enough data. And uh, here, like the quality and what kind of data you would need to have to fully exploit, let's say the cutting edge deep learning, uh, and also to use them for somehow the aiding in the data preparation process and being more efficient in actually generating the data which is needed for, for the deep learning part. I think I'm missing these two things, like, more like a baseline and how to actually fully exploit the deep learning for scenarios where deep learning can be used in terms of label data and preparation of label data. 
Yeah, th thank you, Martin. Keith? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of questions here, right? So, so you know, uh, traditional approaches do offer you a little more introspection into the predictions that the model makes. I uh, mean, maybe not all of them, but but many of them do. And uh, you could say it's a, it's a little more difficult to understand uh, the predictions that the models are making in in the you know with neural models. Uh, there's a lot of work on explainable AI and and identifying. Um, you know, rationales for the decision making, you know, the inferences that uh, neural models are making. Um, it's not exactly taking advantage of traditional approaches. Uh, it's more uh, trying to find ways to attach uh, functionality that we had with the traditional approaches that we're missing with, you know, super complicated neural models that have millions of parameters and uh, their interaction is somewhat opaque. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, th there's also a post hoc analysis of, you know, what the predictions are that a deep learning model makes. And there, I think some of the traditional approaches may be of use, right? So you can identify which entities are actually being identified in the query and the, uh, result if you're doing retrieval, say, and, um, you know, you can make some assertions. You're not actually saying why the model made that prediction, but at least you can do some statistical analysis based on some of the predictions that are more interpretable. Um, so I think that doing more of that or, or setting it up so that we have to do more of that. I mean, you can definitely, you know, maybe going back to the uh, previous point, right? You can definitely try to configure challenges such that this type of, you know, rationales are required, right? Or that there's some, you know, analysis that, you know, a further level of analysis, right? Right now, you know, we have things like, you could say snippets are a rationale, right? For why the document is returned, um, but you could get even more granular uh, in that way. Yeah, I totally agree that this explainability uh, acts is very important nowadays and uh, with a deep learning method, it's more needed than ever. And also for the users, it's very interesting. Uh, Dina. Yeah, so um, I guess pitching the um, establishing these simple baselines to participants, uh, that's probably the challenge participation is probably the only place where you can still publish the <laughs> simple baseline. Uh, because I think in um, many other venues, you could probably have it as a simple baseline compared to your other deep learning approaches, or maybe trying to explain um, the statistics, the sort of use it for descriptive statistics of the data, but not just publish a, an approach uh, without deep learning approaches, to be honest. Um, and uh, I it will be interesting to know that, you know, what is a baseline, what do you guys consider a baseline approach? Say um, the now the traditional machine learning approaches like SVM or, you know, a lot of logistic regression is still used. So is that something that you will consider baselines or should that like be uh, waiting for its next prime time and the baselines could be some regular expressions or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you, Dina. Hong? Okay. Uh, I, I think the, the both traditional approach like the rule-based dictionary lookup or even the, you know, the machine learning like the SVM as Dina said, and also the deep learning method and uh, transformer, all, they have their own weakness and the strengths. And traditional approach are usually, uh, as we all know, are usually easy to understand and explainable and also use less data. On the other hand, the deep learning method are usually more complicated, it's black box, or need more data to, to achieve high accuracy. So I guess it really depends on the real scenario and use cases to see we can then we can choose the most suitable approach to, to solve the problem. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I uh, know. I think there are very interesting points or everything that we have discussed. And uh, the last, uh, the last minutes of, of the panel, I would like your vision or your opinion on how you see the challenges to 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 uh, to to um, to go on in the in the next year. So say in the next decade, do you think it's going to continue as it is? So I think the last. 10 years, if we can go back 10 years, uh, I think that the, uh, the main changes I have seen, uh, it's uh, of course the, the thing that we discuss now that we have a, 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 real, a real change on the methods that they're used. So we have this deep learning uh, wave that came and you know the, the approaches have changed and also the volume of the data has changed. Uh, but I think the format, if I can say of the challenges haven't changed much. Uh, I don't, and I, I don't know if you see this change, uh, how this will go on in, in the next years to come. For, from my point of view, I think the, the things that we have discussed that we should go or we will go, I don't know if we'll go, what, what, how I imagine it, uh, to go to a more realistic task and have the, the end users getting involved. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that, that should, should come. I don't know if it will come, but I, I can see it coming. I don't know what's your opinion on how you see the challenges changing, if there will be any change in the years to come. Um, so Hong, do you want to, to start? Um, sure. So basically, I guess you ask what's the future the challenge yes. exactly. look like? Okay, so I think the, I can think about the four, four directions. So one is, you know, about the con content enrichment with uh, multi modalities of content information in the same the semantic space. Because currently we mainly focus on text uh, semantic space, but in the future, especially when the five G is becoming ready, I think more and more the multimedia content like images, videos, is become more popular, common. So how can we extract the semantic information from these different types of the content into the same semantics space to enrich this, to enrich you know, the text uh, content? I think this is uh, something, one, one thing we, we can think about it. And the second one is move from NLP to the you know, natural language understanding and natural language generation. Actually, na natural language understanding, I think we have already and touch it. So it's semantic, semantic the indexing to identify topics. But how about the next natural language generation? So the machine in the future, I think machine is not only a reader to understand the content, but also is a content creator. Actually, the machine has already been used to create, to generate content now in the many sports news, short, the short news and the stuff. So it's interesting. So when we discuss this, can, can we add some tasks about, for example, the summarization competition, summarization tasks to allow the machine to generate the summarization, either you know, one sentence summarization or normal summarization or structured summarization. So sec the third one is now we move, we not provide the content, but we try to provide the knowledge to the customer. Uh, is it possible for us to build a biomedical knowledge graph in the competition, which contains the, you know, predefined entities and re relationship? So the different teams can contribute to improve and refine the graph. And the, the last one, because uh, I keep reading the, all the AI trending, the one of trend from the perception of AI to the cognitive AI. So today is a perception AI doing very well. So they sometimes they have already equal or exceed human performance in the vision, the songs, rec speech recognition extra. But humans are good at reasoning and the inference, which is a con cognitive AI is about. So can, can we add some tasks about the reasoning inference inference to identify the new insights or the missing connections or hidden knowledge based on the knowledge we extracted. Because most 
all these hidden knowledge or missing connections between the entities and the knowledge point are very valuable. It could be the future, is a hypothesis, could be the future research direction. So this is my opinion, thanks. Thank you, Hong, very interesting points indeed. Um, uh, Keith, you want to go on? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I really like that, Hung. Uh, there's some uh, great points there. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe going along in that direction, uh, the current challenges do seem to be focused around uh, search, right? And, and actually, you know, finding information, whether it's, you know, an answer to a question or particular uh, papers, uh, and maybe a little less about discovery and exploration. And you know, part of that might be you know, a question of who the users are, right? That, that the applications might apply to. Um, uh, you know, and, and to uh, Dina's uh, previous you know, point, we shouldn't just build challenges that are directed at single you know, user use cases, right? But instead, if we do understand the full set of intents, uh, when people are you know, investigating or using some engine over the scholarly literature, if we understand the intents and maybe focus, you know, the challenges might focus on new intents which we haven't explored yet, maybe because the tools just haven't been there yet, right? So some of it might be summarization over result sets or even summarization that allows you to do further exploration or discovery of new you know, aspects of literature that you didn't find just by you know, initiating with a particular question, right? And I think there, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's a little bit of a, um, you know, chicken and egg. Do we create a new challenge that inspires new solutions that might in, inspire a new set of uh, tools that uh, changes the way people, you know, explore in literature, in scholarly liter literature? Or, you know, do we see what people are building now and see are there challenges that, you know, like can actually address the problems that they're trying to build? Maybe they're not, you know, great, but, you know, and, and you know, that there's a little bit of, uh, you know, we have to be visionary in thinking of what might be useful. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, think about, you know, what are the things people are already trying to do where we don't have any challenges related to that. And, uh, you know, and not, not as, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, specific things, but more general cases of exploration or summarization where, uh, you know, people are trying to do this and are trying to incorporate it in their uh, tools and demos. And, uh, you know, what are the users, uh, hope to get out of that or what is the actual user model that we have for building those and then what challenges might actually address those user models uh, I mean hopefully um, you know it ties together a lot of you know pieces here of everything we've talked about realistic tasks and whether you know like what the potential applications are and exactly what the interplay is when developing a challenge you know between the potential tasks and you know how realistic it is and how much that has to be tied to a potential task or an existing uh, or application uh, or an existing application and so on. So, um, and that, you know, I mean, it leaves out the deep learning part, but the deep learning part actually throws in this, there's a whole bunch of new inferences that we're making at much higher accuracy. It's surprisingly, you know, high accuracy with our uh, sophisticated correlation machines, right? And uh, there, I think, uh, you know, there are gonna be all sorts of new things that we haven't necessarily taken into account and maybe we need to think about how can we be flexible uh, and how can you generate new data and have new pipelines to annotate data that might actually be a little bit different than the existing um, annotation procedures and tasks that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Dina? Yeah, all oh, oh, excellent points. So <laughs> very little to add, I think, but uh, you know, the bottleneck then in these new challenges is going to be evaluations because we are still sort of um, relying on individual subjective manual judgments in most cases. So again, a, a really interesting, how can we change the evaluation paradigm? And I know there was, I think Martin was involved in these silver standard years ago. So there were some thoughts, but we are still at that model of evaluation that we have. And another thought is that um, the challenges also multiply over the years. And what I really like about this uh, 
COVID related challenges, there was a lot of synergy where uh, each group did something different and it all contributed. And also the timelines were such that people could participate in all of these. So I think going forward, the whatever challenges um, are there, it will be nice to continue that um, collaboration uh, among the organizers so that the tasks don't step over each other, but are actually beneficial. Yeah, very, very good point also with evaluation. Thank you, Dina. Uh, Martin? So it's I just, you know, want to, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with Dina. I think one thing is having the expert in there, tag a little, learn a little, and see how we can actually, you know, both uh, generate maybe data in a different way, have the end user in the loop. But what I think is even more important is to align the different, let's say, silos or task types uh, uh, using some common data collection, like the named entity resolution, summarization, machine translation, question answering. So if like all these uh, traditional benchmark scenarios, but aligned somehow through, you know, in some common evolution and data collection and not like for each task, a different data, a different kind of people doing it. They're not aligned, not in time, not in scope, not in metrics. Uh, and they are they're basically competing with uh, participants. The four months are very heterogeneous. So really have some effort where you would join the different tasks uh, uh, towards a common goal. And you could actually exploit better what can be extracted by one particular component and applied to another evol uh, evolution uh, setting. Um, I, I think in otherwise, I don't think you can ad advance um, more very efficiently if you're not not aligning the different kind of problems and tasks and even efforts and evaluating them. So I think the COVID-19 effort was very interesting, but there's still you know many disperse uh, efforts and evaluating very specific things, and they're not really coordinated. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank thank you, everyone. I think the 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 points that you have mentioned are all very important, and uh, uh, I would I would like to you know I hope we can meet in a, I don't know in ten years from now and uh, discuss on how things have really evolved and if any of these directions as we have discussed have actually uh, been met. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, I think it was a very, very interesting panel, very interesting discussion. I think many questions were raised and very, uh, very useful things were, were said. I would like to thank you all for participating. It was an honor to have you here. Um, uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, we have to, to go on with the, uh, with the talks that are coming. We have, uh, have some talks that are uh, our, um, uh, our schedule. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Dina, Keith, Martin, and, and Hong for, for, for this opportunity you gave us for the discussion and the interesting points. Uh, it was an honor. And uh, so let's move uh, to the next, to, to the talks. Um, give me a minute. So uh, the next talk, uh, it's uh, on a, a neural text ranking approach for automatic mesh indexing uh, by Alistair Ray. Uh, and uh, Alistair, the, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. We can see also your screen. Yeah. You can start. Okay. Um, so my name is Alistair Ray. I'm, uh, I work for the US National Library of Medicine. And today I'm going to describe a neural text funky approach for automatic mesh indexing. And this was the approach we use for um, the semantic indexing task, task 9A. So here's an overview of the talk. So as I said, um, we're gonna, in this talk, I'm going to present a new neural text funky approach for automatic mesh indexing. And we use a PubMed BERT ranking model, which has been fine tuned on Medline data. And for the ranking, we had obtained candidate main headings for our previously presented convolutional neural network for automatic mesh indexing. Um, we demonstrate point wise, list wise, and multi stage ranking approaches. 
and we showed that we're able to boost the performance of our CNN model by about five percentage points in terms of micro F1 score. And we also demonstrate state-of-the-art performance using a hybrid approach that uses MTI results for setting journals. Um, so the, the model we use is, um, for ranking is um, PubMed BERT, and this is a BERT model, and it's been pre-trained from scratch on PubMed abstracts and PubMed central article full text. And one of these um, uh, specific features that it has domain specific vocabulary that's been derived from PubMed, PubMed central corpus. So I'll first decide our point-wise text ranking approach. And for this, we do relevance classification and we configure um, PubMed for text pair classification. And on the slide, you can see um, the input text we use for the model. And in an information retrieval terminology, the query is the indexing year of the article, the journal title, um, the concatenated with the uh, title of the article and the abstract of the article. And our documents are the names of the main headings. And so for, for this uh, relevance classification, we apply a softmax classification head on top of the uh, contextualized embedding of the CLS token. And our training task is to predict whether a particular main heading um, based on its text name, whether it was indexed or not. And so for training, we sample uh, index and not index main headings from the CNN top results. And then at inference time, we take our fine tuned model and we run it for all candidate main headings from the CNN top results to generate a ranking. And in the terminology of learning to rank, this is a point-wise approach because we're creating a ranking by considering each main heading individually. Um, so next I'll describe our second approach, which is a list-wise text ranking approach. And again, we use PubMed BERT and we configure it for, this time we configure it for text tagging, a bit like you might do for named entity recognition. Um, I've shown on the slide the, uh, the input text for the, the BERT model. And in this case, the query is the same as before, as for the point-wise model, but now the second input sentence to construct this, we take the top end uh, main headings from the CNN model, we shuffle them, and then we concatenate them and separating them with this pipe symbol. And then as you might do for named entity recognition, we apply a softmax classification head to the first token of each of these candidate main headings. And in this particular approach, the training, training task is to predict the, the complete set of main, the set of main headings that are indexed. And so this approach generates a main heading ranking directly. And that's why we refer to it um, as a listwise approach. Um, so our third approach um, is a multi-stage text ranking approach. And the goal of this approach was to improve the recall of the listwise approach by improving the recall at end of the candidate main headings that are fed into a listwise model. And so the procedure is, we first rank the top NP main headings using the pointwise approach. And then we re-rank the top NL main headings using the listwise approach. And the, in the diagram, the diagram on the right tries to illustrate how, how it works. And um, we found that also it was also beneficial for each stage to take the input and output ranking scores at each stage and average them. We found that this improved performance too. Um, decision thresholds. Um, so the three approaches that I've described, they all generate ranking scores. In order to make a prediction of the final set of main headings, we need to apply a threshold. And, we, um, and to do this, we, we um, do a linear search on the validation set to find the optimum threshold that results in the highest micro F1 score. Um, we experimented with two other approaches. One was a multi-stage text ranking approach with COVID-19 rules. And we found that looking at the results of the multi-stage text ranking approach, it was predicting unnecessary uh, main headings related to uh, COVID-19. And we think this is because of inconsistent training data. An example of this is it would often predict with both the COVID-19 main heading and also the coronavirus infections main heading. And the coronavirus infections main heading is not necessary. And so we, uh, we took out the results of our multi-stage text ranking approach. And then we uh, did post-processing to remove these um, unnecessary terms and to increase the precision. And our final approach is a hybrid approach. And we empirically found that this worked well. 
and the approach is to combine MTI and our multi-stage text ranking results. We did this as follows. Um, we, we used the MTI first line index results for MTI first line indexing journals. We used default MTI results for MTI review journals. And then for the rest of the journals, we use our multi-stage text ranking results with COVID-19 rules. Um, the data set we used, um, it was constructed from the Medline PubMed 2021 annual baseline. Um, we excluded, we excluded semi fully and semi-automatically indexed articles because we believe that the indexing of these articles may be influenced by MTI's recommendations. And for the validation set I described, we reserved 20,000 articles published in 2020 and 2021. And the training set was uh, uh, a training set of the recent articles published after 2006. And there was about 10 million of these in total. Um, for the, here's the configuration we used. Um, it was all implemented using Hugging Face Transformers library. Um, we used a PyTorch backend. Um, we used cross entropy loss. The Adam Optimizer, um, a linear learning rate decay to zero with uh, warm up steps. And for the point wise approach, we ranked the top 100 candidate main headings from the CNN model. And for the list wise approach, we re ranked the top 50 terms. And for the point wise approach, we use the balanced training set. Um, training. Um, so the point wise approach was to train for one epic using four NVIDIA V100X 32 gigabyte GPUs. And the uh, this wise approach was trained for 10 epics um, using two NVIDIA V100X GPUs. And both models were trained for 10 days. And this was a limit imposed by the NAH Firewolf cluster that, were, that we were using. And we found that the validation set performance of the this wise model had converged after 10 days. However, the performance of the point wise model was still slowly improving. And um, here are the results for um, Class 9A batch three. Um, we actually, for our PubMed, PubMed BERT models, we only submitted results to the final two weeks of the challenge, but we've uh, independently generated results for weeks one to three, and also evaluated them using the same mesh indexing that was used for the, the BioASK uh, published results. And so table one at the top, um, we compare our system performance to the other systems in the challenge, and for each week we've taken the best performing um, system for each team. And you can see that taking the average of the, the performance over the different weeks, we can see that uh, our hybrid approach um, outperforms uh, the best performing MTI approach by about five percentage points. And we're consistent, we're getting a state of the art performance, which is uh, consistently very similar to the performance of the food on systems. Um, table two at the bottom, we, um, we evaluate the performance of our different approaches on batch three. And in summary, we can see our base approach, baseline approach, the CNN, and when we compare the performance to the multi-stage approach, we can see that we get about a, a five percentage points improvement. We can see that the list-wise approach outperforms the point-wise approach. We can also see that multi-stage, the multi-stage approach is quite beneficial. Um, the COVID-19 rules give a small improvement in performance. And the overall trend is that the, the hybrid approach is the best performing system in all weeks. Um, so it's discussion, um, we, we find that the, the list-wise approach outperformed the point-wise approach. And you might expect this because the list-wise approach is able to consider interactions between main headings. Another interesting finding was that um, the training of the point-wise module will converge more slowly. And we think this is because the point-wise approach per training example that only sees one article main heading pair, whereas the list-wise approach is seen uh, 50, well, we use n equals 50, so it's using seeing 50 such pairs. And so it trains, we think it trains more quickly because of that. Um, one thing that might not be entirely obvious is that the recall of the list wise approach is limited by BERT's maximum input length of 512 tokens. This is because for the list wise approach, the length of the input text is proportional to the number of candidate main headings. And so eventually, as you rank more candidate main headings, you're going to have to start to truncate the text and start trunking, truncating the abstract, and this will eventually lead to worse performance. Um, so it was interesting that uh, COVID-19 rules that we applied were able to uh, improve performance. Um, 
this was because um, the model was, I think it was not producing good COVID-19 indexing because of inconsistent amount of date training data. I think the root cause of the problem was that at the beginning of the pandemic, there weren't, uh, the, the indexers didn't have uh, COVID specific main headings available. So they had to index with um, other related main headings. But then in July, these uh, uh, main headings became available. So the indexing changed quite considerably. And so this is an interesting example of context, concept drift. And um, uh, we think that the high performance of our hybrid approach may indicate that the MTI first line indexing and MTI review indexing may be biased by MTI's recommendations. Um, so in conclusion, we presented a new neural text ranking approach for automatic mesh indexing. Uh, we demonstrated point-wise, list-wise, and multi-stage text ranking approaches. We showed that we were able to boost the CN and then model micro F1 performance by about five percentage points. And our hybrid model that uses MTI predictions for certain journals and also these COVID-19 post-processing rules achieves state-of-the-art performance on task 9A batch three. And in the future, we'd like to investigate the zero shot performance of the neural text ranking model for automatic mesh indexing. Um, the, the question is, say there's a new main heading for which we got no labeled training data. Can the model correctly index that main heading just based on the fact that it's seen that concept during unsupervised pre-training? And that would be very useful for us. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alistair. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any, any question? Either you can write on the chat or you can ask directly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If no one else has a question, I, I have one actually. Yes. I found very interesting the issue about uh, the COVID-19 uh, related rules. And uh, yeah. yes, this is really interesting. Uh, and I was wondering uh, whether, uh, perhaps you already discussed it, but uh, it was not very clear to me, whether you consider these rules as a temporary way for managing these inconsistencies or problems at the moment, or, um, be, uh, or a more um, stable way of handling such cases and incorporating knowledge in such deep learning approaches, because this is one of the um, goals of these systems to combine knowledge with uh, uh, such approaches? Um, yeah, so I think it's, um, we probably plan it to be a temporary solution. Um, perhaps uh, one thing we might want to do in the future is to go up, go and clean up the, the, the training data because um, the training data is, it changes quite, when, when the new COVID-19 main headings were introduced in July, the indexing changes quite considerably. So I think a longer term solution might be to, um, to clean up the training data. Um, I think in this case, rules were quite a good solution because the problem was, um, it, it was quite simple and uh, you could easily correct the problems with the index in a few rules. But um, I think for more complicated problems, it's quite difficult to maintain a large set of rules and keep them up to date. We're hoping this will just be a temporary uh, problem that we can fix with rules. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's move on to the next, to the next talk. Um, the next talk is the NLM at BioAsk Synergy 2021, Deep Learning Based Methods for Biomedical Semantic question answering about COVID-19 by Deepak Gutta. So Deepak, you can see your, yes, we, we yeah. can see your screen. Yes, you can start. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm Deepak Gupta. I worked at NLM NIH. So I'm going to present our BioWASC synergy participation. Uh, so this work, this is a joint work with Morat Saroti, uh, myself, Asma Ben Abacha, and Dr. Dina Damnar Pasma. So uh, before presenting our work, I would like to just give the disclaimer that the, like, uh, the view and opinion expressed do not necessarily state or reflect those of US government and they, they may not have used prioritizing our product endorsement purposes. Uh, 
so uh, coming to the motivation of biowash synergy task so like uh, in in biowash uh, biowash synergy task like biomedical expert poses the unanswered question and like uh, the, the the previous biowash uh, task b is a, like it's a series of tasks so where the first the data was generated and then the data is used for the like for the challenge participation and once the participant submit their results so the assessment is performed so all are independent to each other so here the, the problem is that there is a minimal interaction between the expert and the participating system so this type of task like it may not be less suitable for developing the biomedical de 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 developing the bio uh, the model for the biomedical research topic such as the ongoing covid covid 19 topic so this biowash synergy task so this is more interactive approach and it aims to it aims at a synergy between the expert and the automated question answering system so uh, in the biowash synergy task so like uh, uh, first like uh, the, the questions are formulated by the biomedical expert and it is given to the participant participant submitted their their result and it is you know again evaluated and assessed by the biomedical expert and it is again presented to the like the the participant to like the recheck and calibrate their system so so this is the overall biowash synergy task so i'm going to discuss about uh, like the, the 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 problems which we tried to tackle uh, with our participation so the first task we did that is the retrieving the relevant article and the second is the retrieving the most relevant text snippet and the third when the extracting or generating the ideal answer so given a covid 19 question and our like the the, the scientific article so these three problem we try to tackle uh, part of our participation in biowash synergy so this is this is the overall like, Like the the pipelines looks like for our proposed uh, uh, approach. So we are given uh, the COVID nineteen questions uh, and uh, the scientific article. We have developed the document retrieval, so which retrieve the most relevant uh, documents from the the collections of the the articles. And then the second one is like the uh, the the extraction of the passage from the the retrieved document. And the third is like how we can like use the extracted passage to formulate, uh, means to extract or generate a coherent. answers for the given question so coming to the the first task that is the document retrieval so in the document retrieval given uh, the questions and the code 19 code 19 collections which we used so here first we rank the the document based on the bm 25 uh, scoring mechanism and we obtain uh, top 1000 do uh, document and then we re rank the those document with the help of t5 based relevant t5 relevance based re ranking model so given a question and uh, the document which is ranked from the bm 25 we develop like we develop multiple strategy to do so so in the first strategy which which we call the nlm one run in our paper so in the in the first strategy so the t5 model is fine tuned on the ms marco passage ranking data set and in the second strategy which we develop where the t5 model the uh, t5 model is fine tuned on the ms marco followed by the direct covid passage ranking data set so this is the the like the our, our approach for the document retrieval uh, task uh, coming to the passage retrieval task so in the passage retrieval or oh, basically given a covid 19 question and the, the document which was already uh, doc, already extracted in the previous uh, uh, part of the output of the previous task so we followed the similar similar strategy for the t5 relevance based re ranking model means we are going to re rank the document based on the re relevancy uh, for the questions so uh, in the, in the first uh, strategy we fine tune the ms marco passage ranking data set and we uh, means because we are we aim to only you know extract the passages so we considered each sentence as a passages from the uh, from the retrieved uh, article and in the second strategy we fine tune the ms marco passage ranking data set and we consider instead of considering only one sentence as a passage we considered two sentences as a passage and in the third strategy so uh, the first two strategy was more focused on the ms marco passage ranking data set but in the third strategy we tried to like utilize the in domain data that is the track covid so we fine tune our t5 relevance based re ranking model on ms marco and track covid and similar to the nlm one run here we like we considered one sentence as a passage and in the fourth strategy we fine tune the ms marco and track covid data set and considered the two sentences as a passage so this is the this is the overall like all the four type of strategy which we developed for the passage retrieval task uh, coming to the like, the third problem that is the ideal answer generation extraction so we we try to tackle this problem in two way first is the extractive approach and the second is abstractive approach so in extractive approach given a question and the 
in the passage which was retrieved from the previous task so we use the t5 relevance based re ranking model and we try to like uh, uh, we try to uh, give the summarized uh, say answers for the given question which we call the ideal answer and in the abstractive approach given a passage and the uh, given a passage in the question we utilize the bart based summarization model and uh, like we summarize the passage and provided the output as a uh, like uh, abstractive so, uh, ideal answers for the given question so uh, going deeper into the extractive approach so in the extractive approach given a question in the passage we we like uh, use the t5 relevance based ranking and in our first approach we generate the summary of the questions by joining the top two ranked passage returned by the nlm1 run of the passage retrieval task which i just discussed in the previous slide and in the second strategy we generate the summary by joining the top two ranked passage returned by the nlm2 run of the passage retrieval task so this this two sort of approach we divide for the extractive or uh, extractive approach for the ideal answer generation and in the abstractive approach so uh, like here we fine tune the bart model on the code 19 dataset so based on because the code 19 dataset have several collect several like sections from the from the biomedical literature we uh, we uh, like divide multiple strategy based on the sections so given the, the, the passage and the questions uh, in the first strategy we consider the passage obtained from the nlm1 and like uh, here the bart model which is the summarization model which was already fine tuned by considering the introduction conclusion and result section as a source and abstract section as a target and in the second strategy we consider the passage obtained from the nlm4 run, run from the passage retrieval task and here the part model is fine tuned on the introduction and discussion section by by considering the source and the target section uh, and and we uh, must consider the abstract section of the scientific article as the target in the third strategy we consider the passage obtained by the nlm5 run and here the part model is fine tuned on all all sections of the scientific literature except the uh, except the abstract part of the paper and uh, here uh, again similar to the previous two here again the abstract was considered as a target to fine tune the bart model so as part of the data set so this is the overall like the the questions which we received uh, like 113 covid uh, covid 19 question and we utilize the ms marco data set for passage retrieval and we also use the track covid and uh, obviously like to fine tune the bart model we use the code 19 collection so this is the result for the document retrieval so uh, like uh, if like the, our finding is that the we obtain the best result with our nlm1 run in all batches and the track covid uh, unfortunately could not improve the performance of the system uh, like uh, significantly so And, our, and we like here the results are reported in terms of the mean precision recall left measure map and g map so our our participation our runs obtain similar sort of performance and we compare our performance with the best participant system across best participant system across all the batches and we also uh, like uh, reported the average participant system for each across each, each task in each batches so uh, this is the result for the passage retrieval task and here our finding is that the our nlm1 run achieved the best performance for For, for all the batches and here the results are reported in terms of precision recall of major map the map uh, from, from the bios organizer and the second finding that we observed that the nlm3 achieve the best recall and f score on, on all batches and uh, like uh, there is an increment by in passage length uh, which you know slightly improve the performance because in our strategy uh, like we divide two type of strategy to consider the the passage first is only one set one sentence and the second is by considering the two successive sentences as a passage so when we like augment two successive sentences as a passage so it turns out to be much more uh, effective you then the only considering one sentence and uh, this is the result for the ideal answer generation so this is result only for the batch 2 and uh, here uh, similar to the the previous two task we we compare our performance uh, with the best participant system and average participant system and we observed that our our uh, for this batch 2 our our performance of this nlm3 uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, sorry nlm1 is like very much uh, accurate very much like close to the best participant system so yeah so this is the result for batch 2 and similarly for batch 3 so uh, 
this is the result for batch four and our observations for this ideal answer generation is that that for batch number two the we obtain the best result across all the evaluation metrics with our NLM three run and for batch number three and batch four our NLM one run outperform across all the evaluation metric and similarly the NLM two run has shown better performance across all the metrics amongst the abstractive runs so overall that the extractive model turns out to be much better than the abstractive one uh, for this ideal answer generation task so we also so like uh, this is the result we obtained for the human evaluation of on all the batches batch two three and four in terms of readability recall precision and repetition and uh, uh, the, this this uh, like uh, this uh, met matrix reveal that the our best run achieve the close to the best performing system uh, like for the ideal answer generation task in biowas synergy 2021 so uh, this is the result of the some of the questions and their extractive and abstractive summary so and uh, in conclusion we explored a t5 relevance based re-ranking model for documented passage retrieval task and we exploited the t5 and bar for extracting and generating ideal answer we did not report the uh, the result for the t5 because uh, our internal assessment revealed that the bar model was performing better than the t5 and for ideal generation task we uh, like the extractive approach was much beneficial than the uh, abstractive approach and uh, the, and we also uh, like uh, see that the track COVID uh, data set could not improve the performance of the uh, the system in the passive retrieval task. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Uh, we have a time for a very, very short question, if any. Yeah. Uh, so anyone wants to answer something? Okay, I don't see anything. So uh, probably we should move to the last to the last presentation as we are already a bit uh, late on time. Thank you, Deepak, again. Uh, so uh, let's go on to the last uh, presentation. Uh, it's an end-to-end -end biomedical question answering via bio answer finder and discriminative language representation models by Ibrahim Burat Ostu. We can see your screen. We cannot hear you yet. Okay. Sorry. Now we can see you and we can hear you as well. Okay, okay, great. The floor is yours. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Brachio Zurt. Today I will talk about uh, my paper and uh, First, uh, the BioAnswer Finder. Oh, sorry. Like this. The, uh, first, I start with the uh, the BioAnswer Finder, which is a a system I have developed uh, as a side project under NIH and IDDK project in 2019, and uh, the the modules uh, which are shown in blue are the new modules for for the BioSQ task. Uh, both Synergy and uh, the Bioski 9B. And uh, the modules of this system can be grouped in logic into questions, uh, question processing, document processing, and answer processing phases. In the question processing phase, like first uh, the natural language question is parsed, then a rule-based detection uh, of the focus of the question is done. Then the uh, search keywords selection uh, uh, from the words of question is done by a LSTM based keyword classifier using globe based biomedical word embeddings. And in, it was in the original one. In the, in the Bioski 9B, this is replaced by BioElectra++, which will uh, base keyword tagger, which I will explain later. And document processing phase involves an iterative, most specific to most generic keyword search guided by the keyword classifier selected keywords to retrieve relevant set of documents from an elastic search index. And the order of the keywords are, that are dropped from, the, from one iteration to iteration is learned from a set of annotated by five beast questions using a pairwise ranking classifier based on rank net with LSTM using self-attention and also with globe biomedical word phrase embeddings. The answer processing phase involves a rule-based question type detection. The types are focus, definition, question, or other. 
And on definition questions are handled by definition syntactic patterns. For questions where a, a focus entity focus is detected, the entity type is used for filter as a filtering process. About nine entity types are recognized by lookup tables, like which includes gene, protein, in, enzyme, disease, drug, and others. And for non-definition questions, the answer candidate sentences are ranked by a weighted version of the relaxed word movers distance using GLOVE biomedical word phrase embeddings. And after the first ranking, there's uh, up to the first hundred of those sentences are further ranked by a fine-tuned BERT classifier. Uh, this was in the original one in the, uh, in, for Bioski 9B, the, a bioelectra based ranker is used. Uh, the, uh, basically, uh, an electra is is a dis, uh, is different from most most of the uh, language model, like the uh, language representation models, because it it is trained discriminatively instead of uh, uh, generatively, like the uh, using um, uh, mass. Uh, language training approach where you mask like certain parts of the certain tokens of, of a sentence and you try to basically find the probability of that token given the context. But in a in Electra, Electra is has like the two parts. It's 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 a pre-trained and discriminative manner to detect replace tokens which are sampled from a jointly trained masked language transformer model, which is uh, which is then discarded in, in the joint inference and like the fine tuning. And it, it is shown like to, to be more efficient than uh, Bert and uh, most of the other, other transformer models at, uh, at given the same size of the models. And the improvements are especially pronounced for smaller models. And usually uh, there's a very large cost involved at inference time for large models. So a smaller model with the same, same or better performance is usually much uh, preferred. These are the uh, the four systems uh, which are pre-trained. Uh, the first system is like I I have pre-trained that one uh, early last year, and uh, the others. Uh, and they are pretty, the first one is, pretty, is, is basically corresponds to electro small model, which, and they go up to the base, which is the largest you can have in, on a single TPU with, with eight cores. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to, to use the mid, mid size models uh, and and uh, they're uh, pre-trained from scratch and uh, like the, uh, with, with a new, like the biomedical specific vocabulary because uh, like in electoral vocabulary, like for example, BRCA1 is, is, is composed out of like single, almost single letters. So it, it, it has, uh, it, it doesn't retain the meaning of that is, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's basically a gene, but in in the bioelectro vocabulary, it is it is made up like the, the gene part and the, its number, for example. And two protein uh, corpuses are used. One is like the pop and abstracts, and uh, the other one is the full full text papers from the uh, uh, from the pop And uh, all models except bioelectro meat is trained with uh, one million steps on corpus one and followed by 200,000 steps on corpus two. On the bio meat combine is basically, the training data is combined and it, it, it all trained to up to 1.2 million steps. And these, these are the, like, the hardware and training times and thank you for the TFRC to provide the TPU time. And, uh, and the, like see the bioelectric is trained on a, like basically a, uh, consumer grade GPU in 48 days, the others are like a bin. And next, uh, I will go through 
through like the evaluating this this approach on on the different models of like the mod, uh, modules of the um, by answer finder like the uh, for question answering basically like the exact answer ex extraction training and testing sets are generated from the factor and list questions from bioSK 8b training set so by exact match on 70 percent of them can be matched then I, I did a, a basic manual ins inspection on the rest and I can recover 152 other by synonym than transliterations also 8, 8 to 5 8, 15 percent uh, training testing set and for each language model in every like the 10 random initial systems are fine-tuned and the average and the standard deviations are shown like uh, uh, using the squad uh, metrics uh, based, uh, like bioelectra meet uh, had the best approach and it, it outperforming birth and bio birth significantly uh, and it, it also outperformed actually the larger models, larger bioelectro models. And for answer ranking, re ranking, the 100 answer candidates per question are returned, which are returned by the weighted uh, relaxed word moves distance ranker, are annotated as relevant or, or no, up to the first occurrence of correct answer from the BioSK 5B training that is done some, some time ago. And so the data is noisy because it's it's only up to the first correct answer. There can be more answers down the stream. So it's about 50,000 sentences from 400, almost 520 questions and 9,000 for the, And it uses zero one loss and on high on a highly unbalanced data set, but, but to compensate also like the weighted of the weighted loss function is also used and all of the scores are used for ranking these are the the, the mmrs uh, for different ap uh, approaches and it's it's actually like by the even small model is like very very good uh, beating both bert and by uh, uh, but i i choose the the mid size model because it 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 has half 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 size the, the, the parameters uh, and it's, it's twice as, as, as fast the other, uh, the base model. Uh, for search keywords, uh, uh, the, the, like the classification, uh, the, the test data is like the, it's, it's from the BioSQ 5B, 752 training questions, 100 test questions. And they're annotated like for each word, whether they're, they could be, uh, keyword or not and then uh, the first model is like the, is a multi input model and uh, then I also use like bioelectra uh, and and cast the task as a like sequence tagging cat, uh, task and it's it's significant significant to outperform then it's a, it's a very important step in the in the, uh, the retrieval process uh, so like the better the better you, you are like it, it, it's it's mm, the most you can recover the, the better the results will be downstream results for for the yes no like the question model, model selection basically it's, it's a polarity uh, classification 720 to seven yes no questions that uh, like the uh, uh, for training and 128 question for for testing are uh, uh, selected from the from bios uh, 8b training data with ideal answers and like the and after removed the in usually yes no at the beginning uh, and these are like the uh, the base model which is trained for one million steps show the best performance and that one is selected for further investigation uh, but uh, the the system uses snippet sentences for detect uh, for for yes no and answer uh, uh, classification and uh, but not all of the sentences have a yes no polarity they they can be neutral uh, neutral and so uh, 
they are pre-selected by using R RVM D-based sentence question similarity, and then then many look annotated. And then three voting systems are tested for yes no decision, and the best was uh, basically the neutral classifiers significantly outperforms the, the just yes no classification, so that the neutral uh, neutral uh, sentences are basically f f removed for, from from consideration first, and then the, the yes no decision based on score voting. For summary questions, there are like two both extractive and some uh, abstractive summarization approaches are used. Like the, the extractive summarization is based, uh, uh, the bio answer finder creates basically uh, without ret retrofitting the answer candidate sentences. And 10 uh, of those, the first sentences are put into input. And then to minimize repetition and hierarchical agglomerative clustering using weighted class word mover distance similarities used to group sentences and the cluster merge stop similarities. So threshold is, is, used, is found by ROG2 score on B training summaries. So on, on, on the prototype sentences are selected basically. Abstract summarization, it uses a, for a T5 base, uh, like the pre-trained model as a transform, which is an encoder decoder model to generate summary generation. It is fine-tuned with combined snippet as a document and the ideal answer as a summary for all the summary questions from the BioSK 8P training set. The ideal answer generation basically is, uh, is for different questions, uh, type of questions is for factor questions, the highest ranked candidate sentence containing the highest scores exact answer is selected. For this question, the highest ranked candidate sentence containing the most number of highest scored exact answers and the highest ranked sentence for the yes and summary is, is questions extract about or abstract summarization for different systems. And in, in its synergy, uh, systems are ba uh, basically you, it's, it's done that before the bioelectron models are trained. Uh, I mean, besides the small one. Um, so it uses the Electra base, and uh, it it used actually old uh, Glove uh, word embeddings, which didn't have the concept of COVID, and I, I recognize this in the in the in the third round actually. So it the first round first version is is, is wasn't very good, but in the second one it was better actually. And the the ideal. Uh, so basically the highlights of the, to some of the results for in the synergy one is the average performance due to out of word glow vectors in the first two rounds. The synergy version two, the system is like the almost same as BioSK 9B and the, in the exact answer, it was best system for yes factoid at least in the round three and idle and the best system in rock stores in all rounds and best in manual scores for round two and three. And for the BioSK, 9B phase A, it was the best F1 score in four batches and second in the remaining. On Cinepus, second best in two batches and third in three batches. BioSK 9B uh, phase B, yes, no questions, it's second best in batches two and three. And in idle and the best rock score in four batches one and two. And it, it was better in the actually in, in uh, man, final manual scores. In, in, almost in all of them, it was the first, I think. And then I did some error analysis uh, on, the, on, the, on the exact answers and see what, like on, on 8P data, see where the errors are. And the most of the errors are actually, is like near misses. It's bare, basically, here, here are some of them. As you can see, for example, like the, especially like the, in the, the fourth, the system predicted in, in, like in, in American like date format, but the annotation was in, in, in like the European date format, but the same amount, like for, or like how large is like the, like more, it's, it's they are basically very small uh, differences. And that uh, highlights the importance of manual, manual uh, 
actual annotation of, over like the uh, automatic evaluation, which can miss a lot of like the near misses. And uh, these are the source code and other like the, the, the trained models, which which can be downloaded. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, Rahim. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Um, so uh, I would like to conclude this session. We're also 10 minutes late, sorry about that. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a very interesting session. We had the panel discussion, we have very interesting talks. Uh, I would like to thank you all. Uh, as you know, we have a, another session tomorrow morning uh, from 11.30 to 1, Bucharest time. Uh, and we hope to see you all there, uh, at least the one where the time zone is, uh, you know, is suitable. Uh, Thank you, thank, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you tomorrow, then. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you very much.